are sort of looking at forming. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Erin Will Morton. I direct the Global Health Technologies Coalition. And I'm pleased to welcome you here today as we launch our seventh annual policy report. GHTC brings together more than 25 nonprofit organizations to promote policies that boost the development of new drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, and other health tools. New tools that will bring healthy lives within reach for all people. It's been a busy week for GHTC. In addition to our policy report and the distinguished panel we're about to hear from, on Friday, we launched a new website to showcase our work, our members, and the desperate need for global health R&D. Please visit us at ghtcoalition.org to see our new home. I also encourage you to take some time after our panel concludes to browse the exhibits around the room. Our members and several US agencies are displaying global health technologies in various stages of development. I also want to take a moment to recognize Senator Murray and her staff. Senator Murray is a tireless champion for global health R&D. She's committed to improving health conditions at home and abroad. In fact, we literally wouldn't be here today if it weren't for her. She helped to secure the room, so thank you, Senator Murray. Our policy report comes at a key moment. Just as the global community was working to stop the largest Ebola outbreak in history, a new threat arose, the Zika virus. While scientists are moving quickly to understand more about Zika, there's still much we did not know. But we do know that we don't have the tools we need to fight it. There is no drug to treat Zika, no vaccine to prevent it, and existing diagnostic tests are limited. Emerging diseases like Zika and Ebola threaten lives. They can disrupt international commerce, and strike fear into people around the world. Our response to these unexpected outbreaks must be strong and efficient, and it must include new R&D. But we must also remember that there, these are not the only global health threats that we face. Today, half of the global population is at risk for malaria, and drug-resistant strains continue to grow. Tuberculosis killed 1.5 million people in 2014. That's more than AIDS. One in 12 children in sub-Saharan Africa still die before they turn five. There were 1.4 million new HIV infections in sub-Saharan Africa in 2014 alone. And more than a billion people in 149 countries are affected by neglected tropical diseases. That's not to say we haven't made some progress. There is some good news. There have been, there's been a 58% reduction in malaria mortality since 2000 driven in part by the scale-up of bed nets and the introduction of new anti-malarial therapies. We've seen a 45% reduction in maternal mortality since 1990, due in part to the introduction and scale-up of new tools to reduce complications from childbirth, like postpartum hemorrhage and preeclampsia. We've eliminated onchocerciasis, or river blindness, from Colombia and Ecuador. And maybe the most exciting, in 2004, we had only 215 products for neglected diseases in the pipeline. Today, just over 10 years later, we have almost 500 global health products in the pipeline. These successes tell us something, and that something is the theme of this year's GHTC policy report. Goal setting works, and research and development for new health technologies is key to achieving goals in global health. Innovation has always been at the forefront of advancements in health, from novel vaccines for polio and smallpox, to packaging that helps essential treatments remain effective without refrigeration. We can't curb the spread of TB without better treatments. We can't end maternal and child deaths without new innovations for women's health. There are some neglected tropical diseases for which effective treatments don't even exist. And we will not accelerate the end of HIV and AIDS without a cure for HIV or new tools to treat and prevent virus transmission. Improvements in global health demonstrate that transformative change is only possible when people come together around collective common set of goals and mobilize resources to drive collective action. Innovation can help deliver a world in which every person has the opportunity to lead a healthy life. That's the big goal. That's the goal that drives us all. Our report challenges the US government to embrace three goals to help us get there. Number one, sustain current investments and mobilize new resources to support global health R&D. 
We can't make progress without public, sustained public funding for global health. And public funding's not enough. We need to think of new ways to incentivize R&D. Number two, improve coordination, alignment, and transparency of global health R&D. Our dollars are best spent when agencies are working closely together and where there's a clear strategy for global health R&D. We saw this play out really well during the response to Ebola when USAID and CDC and DOD and the White House worked together around the Ebola Grand Challenge to solicit ideas for innovations to help stop the Ebola outbreak. And number three, streamline and strengthen regulatory pathways for global health. Developing new tools and technologies is only part of the process. We need strong systems in place to ensure products are safe and effective for use. The FDA plays a key role as a stringent regulatory authority, and their collaboration with agencies in global health is essential to improving access to these technologies. So we know the what. The what is that achieving ambitious global health goals requires equally ambitious goals to accelerate global health R&D. The how? Well, the how is why we wrote this report. There's more detail, background, and specific policy recommendations in the report, which is online and available around the room. I encourage you to read more and to join the dialogue with GHTC to help us advance the development of essential health technologies. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel, Dr. Peter Hotez, Dr. David Schultz, Dr. Patrick Ketcher, and Ambassador Jimmy Kolker, some of whom have braved natural disasters to be with us here today. <laughs> and I'm going to break things up here a little and sit in the middle of these fine fellows. Uh, Dr. Hotez, the first question goes to you. You've got an impressive career working to advance new medical and global health technologies, including your work at the Sabin Vaccine Institute, ASTMH, Baylor Collar of Medicine, your position as US Science Envoy. Am I missing anything? Sure. That's a good start. <laughs> Drawing on these experiences, why is sustained investment in global health R&D so important? Why is it that we can't just focus on things when they emerge or, or pop up? Why do we need this sort of long-term plan for global health? Well, I'm wondering if I should stand up because all you see is podium here. So Please maybe I'll. Uh, like. <laughs> of course, all you'll you still you still see is podium. <laughs> uh, well, thanks. Thanks so much for uh, asking the question, and thank you to the Global Health Technologies Coalition for for uh, supporting this. I've just flown in from Houston. I was hoping to fly out yesterday, but um, we have a new hobby in Houston. It's, we we think of our bayous as alternative highways, and we <laughs> we drive our cars through the bayous. This is um, what I. First of all, let me ask, how many people here uh, currently are working uh, on the Hill with a senator, with a congressman, uh, uh, or related committee activities? Raise your hands. So the first thing I want to do is thank you. Uh, and the reason I want to thank you is because we've recently completed a mega analysis. And I say we, I'm a small part of what's known as the Global Burden of Disease Study that's looked at the impact of all the federal appropriations that have been uh, uh, put out there since the launch of the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, looking at a snapshot of what's happened over the last 15 years. And because of what you guys did, uh, it's absolutely impressive. We've seen now a 60 to 80 percent reduction in the number of deaths of measles, tetanus, haemophilus influenza type B, rotavirus for expanded use of vaccines. You guys did that um, through uh, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. 19 million lives have been saved from HIV AIDS. 30 to 50 percent reduction in malaria deaths and cases. Uh, we're now on the verge of eliminating lymphatic filariasis, maybe river blindness and trachoma. All of that has happened because the U.S. government has stepped up uh, uh, to appropriate funds for these big global programs like USAID and TD program, that neglected tropical disease program, the President's Malaria Initiative, PEPFAR, Gavi, and, us, and several other acronyms. Uh, and this has been an absolute game changer. Uh, the problem is we still need to complete, continue those appropriations, continue those big programs, but we do desperately need some new tools, some new technologies to really expand our efforts and really finish the job. And let me give you an example of what, uh, what I mean by that. Uh, it would have been nice to have an Ebola vaccine 
2014. The truth is the technology to develop the Ebola vaccine was published in Nature magazine by Gary Nabel's group in 2003. But what happened? The technology sat there. It sat there for more than a decade with making incremental improvements, but basically it sat there because the model's broken. The model says that a university or academic researcher develops a promising technology. It's then licensed to a major pharmaceutical company. Uh, and then it's turned into the bottle of product uh, for clinical trials. And of course, that didn't happen with Ebola because Ebola is a neglected tropical disease. And there was no uh, financial incentives for the major pharmaceutical companies to step up, up and do that. It's not that the pharmaceutical companies are bad guys. They've donated uh, most of the drugs that we have for controlling neglected tropical diseases to the tune of more than a billion doses of several drugs. So they've stepped up in a big way. But it's very difficult for the CEOs of these companies to go back to their shareholders and say, let us invest in technologies which are with a guaranteed market failure because they're, disease they're targeting diseases that only affect the world's poorest people. So what happened was uh, we had a crisis in West Africa in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And when the crisis reached a certain level, the US government then stepped in again through BARDA, through the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority, put up $100 million or more, and then GlaxoSmithKline, Merck, Crucell came in and turned it into a bottle of vaccine for clinical trials. And by the time, the time clinical testing was underway, what happened? That's right, Ebola was gone and 11,000 people had perished. So what it means is that we have some real gaps in the system for how we're going to shape these new technologies. And we can list about at least a dozen uh, different diseases for which we need vaccines and other uh, small molecule drugs uh, and diagnostics. So the first part to fix this problem is, first of all, I think we need new actors. We cannot depend exclusively on the big pharmaceutical companies. We need them, but we're going to have to incentivize other organizations, including small to mid-sized biotechs, as well as these very interesting group of nonprofit organizations known as PDPs, Product Development Partnerships. My kids like to call it dad's guaranteed money losing companies, but we don't like to call it that, so we call them PDP. So I had a PDP called the Sabin Vaccine Institute. Uh, David, you're going to hear from uh, heads another PDP. And what we're doing is developing innovations in the nonprofit sectors that the other companies uh, wouldn't touch. So we've got several vaccines, not for hookworm, it's just azomiasis and Chagas disease and leishmaniasis and clinical trials. Unfortunately, the PDPs fall through the cracks in terms of finding ways to provide innovations. We, the SBIR mechanisms, for instance, that support small businesses are not available to PDPs. We've got to figure out a way to help, help those organizations. I think the second big piece to this is we're overly reliant on the US government for uh, all this support. Uh, there's a, a report known as the G-Finder report, uh, which is put out by Paula Secures based in Australia, that carefully looks at the metrics for global health technologies for what they call neglected diseases. And they define them broadly to include the neglected tropical diseases, AIDS, TB, and malaria. And, uh, and that includes both basic research and product development research. So on the basic research and product development side, the US government is putting up 70% of the funding. The second is the UK government. Third is the government known as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, fourth, uh, and then the distant fourth, fifth, and sixth is Germany, France, uh, uh, and, uh, and the Netherlands. And so the problem is we need to bring in some other countries. And I've uh, recently finished a book that's going to come out in a month or two looking at where, looking at a reanalysis after the Millennium Development Goals and all the gains, where the neglected tropical diseases actually occur. And one of the real shockers was that 70% of the world's Neglected tropical diseases, as well as TB and others, actually occur in G20 countries, group of 20 countries. What we're finding is today, the poor living among the wealthy, the poor living in the 20 wealthiest economies, account for most of the world's neglected diseases. So in some ways, it's not just a resource failure, it's also a failure from the elected leaders of the G20 countries to also step in and, and help to match some of the US and UK efforts. So for instance, China's doing nothing. Uh, Japan's doing a little more than nothing, but they're starting. Uh, Russia does nothing, and we can go, uh, Brazil does nothing. So we, and we can go down the list. So I think 
what we, what the two gaps that we need to fix is one, utilize our Office of Global Health Diplomacy in the State Department to work with the G20 elected leaders and work with G20 summits to getting them to step up. I also think the other gap that we have is a lot of that U.S. government commitment that's so important is uh, not specifically targeted for product development. That it's, it's a lot of that is very, um, very important upstream research, but we still have gaps in product development. I've suggested that if we could take uh, the President's Global Health Initiative, which is now funded to the tune of, a, of a, a $10 billion, if we could set aside 1% to 2% of that for global health technologies, that would pump 100 to 200 million new dollars into the system, uh, which would be a, that's my Bayou flood alert that I'm still <laughs> flying up from Houston, flew up from Houston this morning. Um, that would uh, put 100 to 200 new, million new dollars in the system. And, and we've never done that before. We've never thought about funding from state or USAID going for technologies with some rare specific appropriations for AIDS vaccines. So I think that would be an interesting discussion to have as well today. So that's kind of the big picture overview, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dr. Hotez. Uh, Dr. Schultz, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about your work with PATH and your work with the private sector, with governments, with local communities. Um, why is this multi-sectoral partnership approach so important? Peter mentioned a little bit about how PDPs work. If you could give us some examples from the PATH perspective. Great, thank you very much. Well, the first thing I wanna do is, is echo Peter's sentiments of appreciation and, and a very deep appreciation to all of you and to the members of Congress that you work with and, and others. There are many times when I'm traveling um, in low and middle income countries that I feel a deep sense of gratitude and pride in being uh, a US citizen. But one time really sticks with me and before I talk about innovation and partnerships, I wanna just share that because I think that it demonstrates why the US role in global health leadership is so incredibly important. My wife is a pediatrician and we had the chance to travel with our younger son who was 15 or 16 at the time to a orphanage outside of Nairobi, Kenya and to stay there for a while. And um, my wife um, actually having, uh, being a real doctor as she says, as opposed to me, um, was able to, um, to uh, spend a lot of time with the orphans who were living there, 25% of whom had HIV AIDS infection, the remainder of whom were actually orphaned because of HIV AIDS infection um, right in Nairobi. And uh, so she was doing medical work, I was doing other things and um, I asked her after she had seen these um, kids how the kids who were HIV positive were doing, and she said, you know, they're all remarkably healthy. In fact, they're about as healthy as the children that I see in my suburban practice in Washington State. And I said, why is that? And she said, well, apparently they go to town every month and they get HIV AIDS specific care and they also receive medications. And of the 25 children who were HIV positive, only one was actually struggling with his HIV infection. And the reason was that the children were receiving all of their HIV care and medications through US government PEPFAR funded programs. And um, I have to say that I had to have a, a, a moment of pause for myself to reflect on the fact that here we were, thousands of miles from, from the US, uh, in a, a very poor setting with the poorest of the poor. And in fact, it was our government, our PEPFAR dollars that were actually ensuring that those children uh, were cared for monthly, were cared for well, and were, in my wife's words, as healthy as the children that are, were, she, were, she was seeing in her suburban pediatric practice. And um, you can tell I'm affected by that. My, my heart swelled as an American that evening, and I wanna thank all of you for making that possible. As, um, as Aaron mentioned though, there are many other parts of this value chain besides just governmental funding that we need to be uh, paying attention to. And, and two of those are actually the importance of new health technology innovations and these product development partnerships. PATH is an organization that has a, a pipeline of more than 200 different health technologies, vaccines, diagnostics, new drugs, devices, and tools, and we often work in, in concert with our colleagues and, and friends like Peter Hotez at the Sabin Vaccine Institute and with other PDPs. We often work in concert with 
uh, private sector part participants, with, with other NGOs, and with funders. And innovation has always played a very critical role in making the advances in, in, uh, in global health that we have made. Whether we're talking about smallpox vaccine, whether we're talking about polio immunization, and as you all know, we are getting very close to actually eliminating polio, which will just be a historic, enormous contribution to, uh, to the health of the world, and without U.S. leadership, this would not have happened. And other vaccines, like the meningitis A vaccine, which many of you have, may not have heard of, this was the born of a remarkable partnership that included uh, the NIH, the FDA, a small uh, biotech company in Europe, the Gates Foundation, and PATH. It's the first vaccine ever developed just for uh, the African context. And now more than 250 million people have safely received the vaccine over the past three years. We know because of incredible surveillance and scrutiny that not a single person has actually come down with meningitis A who has received the vaccine. And where meningitis A epidemics used to be the scourge of a particular season in the so-called meningitis belt in the sub-Saharan Africa, uh, today that's changing. And more importantly, we're going on to now develop a a vaccine that has multiple strains of meningitis so that we can actually hopefully eliminate meningitis outbreaks um, for good uh, in, this part of, in this part of Africa. Without the partnerships, without the funding, without the innovation, none of this would be possible. And while it's very important for the U.S. and other governments to continue to maintain, if not increase, their funding, I also think that it's very important to be thinking about what are the incentive mechanisms that we can set free, whether those are tax credits, whether they're incentive programs like the priority review voucher, uh, advanced market commitments, other types of incentive mechanisms, so that we can actually pull in new participants to, uh, to the global health uh, product development sector. And in fact, tomorrow, or this evening actually, I'll be heading uh, to New York to participate in one of the oversight committees for the Global Health Investment Fund, which is a fund that seeks to create modest returns for investors, but as importantly, or in my eyes, more importantly, actually is investing only in global health products that have the chance to actually be available and be making an impact in the next three to five years. Thank you. Uh, moving on to talk to some of our U.S. government colleagues here. Um, Dr. Ketcher, the, the CDC works, uh, we hear, to prevent, detect, and respond. These are the words that we, that we hear about CDC's work. Could you talk a little bit more about the agency's role specifically as it relates to global health R&D and how that sort of fits into the overall mission of what the CDC is doing right now? Thanks, Aaron, and congratulations to you and the, your staff at the coalition for pulling together the report. Uh, it's really a valuable uh, tool for our community. At CDC, we play an important role in, in developing new technologies, new tools, and interventions that help us with our, our goals of pre preventing, detecting, and responding to global disease threats. Um, a lot of our work uh, in R&D uh, recently is focused on developing new diagnostic tests or taking technologies that, uh, that are available and adapting them to the, the difficult field conditions under which uh, a lot of uh, global health work uh, requires that they be ready to be used. Um, on display here today from the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases are, are some of our products, including a, a point of care test for yellow fever, we're working with partners now uh, on Zika, and the report includes a really uh, illuminating uh, story about the successful work that uh, CDC and others across government and across sectors uh, collaborated on to, uh, to enable a breakthrough in, in the availability of testing for Ebola virus in West Africa over the last two years. I guess I'd like to take a bit of, of, of time, too, to focus some attention on the whole of the R&D cycle. Um, it's, it's easy for me to cite a, situations where CDC is contributing in bench-based work or in clinical trial research that we easily recognize as R&D. 
But we also have an important role in the next steps, the, the, the sometimes forgotten steps of R&D, translating those findings into uh, functional uh, programs. I'm really lucky that at the start of my career, uh, I, I did malaria research uh, supported by CDC and USAID, first to study whether or not insecticide-treated nets uh, could have an impact on reducing child mortality in some of the most high transmission areas in East Africa. And then to explore whether, whether uh, we could practically introduce the uh, newly recommended combination of artemisinin and, and conventional drugs that uh, was being proposed as a, as a, a last ditch hope against the advancing uh, drug resistance phenomenon. Um, and I'm here 20 years later. Um, sorry, I'm emotional about this too, but you know, six and a half mil million children's lives have been saved because of US government investments in those technologies. And uh, we're at the point now where we need to be looking forward to what are the next breakthroughs that are gonna make that kind of an impact. And uh, I'm, I'm really encouraged by all of you who come out today and the work that you do on the Hill because it really matters to us and it really translates to lives saved. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can tell there's a lot of passion here among our panelists for the work that you all have been doing. Ambassador Kolker, uh, when people think about the Department of Health and Human Services, they often think about the domestic work that your agency is doing. But could you talk a little bit about how that domestic work also feeds into some of your work in global health and why those two things are really important within HHS? Sure. Thanks, Erin. And I am going to take a brief diversion as some of the others have to talk first about a personal experience. I'm confident I'm the only person in this room who was a Senate staff member, 1973-74, <laughs> when Senators Ir Sam Irvin and Howard Baker and others sat at that end of this room for the Watergate hearings, which went on for nearly a year. And we, a lot of the very junior staff used to stand outside those doors and try to get a peek in. And I, it has been 40 years since I've been near this room. I don't think I was ever inside, actually. But um, so I, there, it, this is historic ground and, and brings back uh, amazing memories. I also, uh, as Peter Otez said, the PEPFAR and the President's Malaria Initiative were game changers and they changed a lot of lives and mine was one of them. I, after four years working on Senate staff, I actually joined the Foreign Service and had a 30-year career as U.S. diplomat. Got to be ambassador twice, first in Burkina Faso, which was the place they did the malaria, the, uh, meningitis vaccine program with a huge impact there um, with USAID and CDC support, but also uh, then in Uganda. And Uganda, PEPFAR was designed with Uganda in mind and it was a spotlight, it had the largest budget. And pretty much anyone who needed, to, who was in the international AIDS um, effort needed to be in Uganda in 2003, 2004, 2005 when I was there. And I learned a tremendous amount, and the, through, I think, um, a brilliant stroke, they actually had ambassadors and country teams responsible for picking partners, for um, dividing money among agencies, and especially for being accountable for results. And we had very specific targets. And I'm pleased to say that in those first three years in Uganda, we actually tripled the targets we were supposed to have reached. And saved tens of thousands of lives, but also it changed mine dramatically in that I realized that the, the tiny pond in which I was operating as an AIDS diplomat or a global health diplomat, um, there, I, I was one of the only fish. And that this was so necessary in terms of the relationship, just as Aaron's question implied, between what we do domestically and the expertise we have in Department of Health and Human Services 11 very autonomous operating divisions, such as Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, National Institutes of Health, Food and Drug Administration, and, and many others. And the, the small office we have, which is trying to look at policy and coordination of HHS as a global actor. And having come from a sort of political and diplomatic mindset to uh, one where it's doctors and scientists who are the main drivers of what we do, it's been fascinating in that when there's a problem, 
We have terrific people who do gather the data and evidence, do the research, and if the evidence is strong enough, publish a peer review article and have solved that problem. But I think all of us in the sort of public policy space realize that that's just the beginning of solving the problem and that how to get our priorities and to get that evidence onto the agenda of policymakers to change government policy, to move the technologies so that they can actually reach the people who need to take advantage of them is an important skill in itself. And that we're, we've been able in HHS to try to match that both in terms of reaching back to the expertise that we have on staff already in the operating divisions in HHS in response to emergencies, routine outbreaks, as well as research to bring that to bear on challenges and opportunities overseas. And also to look at what's going on around the world and realize that the health of the American people very much benefits not just from stopping outbreaks from becoming epidemics, but also there's research going on in a huge number of areas with practical solutions that we can apply domestically to improve the way we do business, uh, look at different techniques for uh, achieving quality results, perhaps at less cost or with uh, better outcomes for, for our patients. And so we do, at HHS, we just put out a glo new global strategy, and I brought three copies so if people mob the podium, they can, they can get one. Um, in which we talk about the three goals being, as I said, the health and well-being of Americans through global action, international leadership and technical expertise in science policy programs and practice, and then international diplomacy development and security where we can actually bring these U.S. assets to bear and take advantage of uh, counterpart relations. I know we want to get to your own questions, but I'll just give two examples of things that just happened already this year. In February, I was able to join a, a high-level delegation that had actually been requested by the president of Brazil. We don't know how much longer she's going to be president, but she, um, <laughs> she did uh, talk to President Obama about, would you please send your experts here to sort of validate what we're doing? We think we're doing the right thing, but we need the U.S. to be even more involved. And we did with uh, people from CDC, two of the National Institutes of Health, from Food and Drug Administration, from BARDA, which works on vaccines and so on, and the, we were able in just a couple of days to go through a number of the bottlenecks, for which from our point of view has been, was a difficulty in obtaining live virus or samples, and Zika is particularly difficult because it, its live state is very short. Um, and what we came up with was actually something that has proved to be very valuable, which is um, a bioreservoir in Brazil itself, a good institute they have called Fiocruz, which was already very involved in uh, the Zika response, said, no, you come and you can test your diagnostics here, even your private sector. We, we will be the biorepository to accumulate the samples you'll need to get, for instance, the diagnostic for blood safety, but also to be able to distinguish the Zika virus from dengue from others that are uh, related and carried by the same vector. So it, it, the role of global health diplomacy in trying to bring that together, very much looking at what is the technology, what is the critical path we need to get um, what we know to people and to figure out when we don't know it, who needs to work together to share information to, to reach that result. Another great trip was to India when Prime Minister Modi was here, he and President Obama agreed to a number of areas, but there's an 11-point health agenda that was part of that summit's outcome. And three of the working groups for that, those 11 points, met in, in New Delhi in March, and the, um, one was on cancer, and there are lots of things that India is doing in cancer research that we can learn from, and they, of course, are eager to be involved in, in what we do. But um, Two, two of the others were less conventional, one for antimicrobial resistance, which if I were going to highlight one area where global health technology could really save lives and is needed uh, with a hot issue internationally, WHO is going to be focusing on it. There'll be a UN General Assembly session on it um, in September with the, this sense that not just for stewardship, for good stewardship of antibiotics, you need a diagnostic. The biggest need is right now to be able to distinguish at point of care between a viral and a bacteria-caused infection. 
And if any of you in the room or through your coalition, you can come up with that. It's another of the, there's prizes available, but it also would save billions of dollars, literally. We had um, uh, 23,000 lives and $20 billion unnecessarily lost to um, uh, micro, antimicrobial resistance or uh, bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. So, and India's role in that is very important because they manufacture many of the drugs and in fact don't, sometimes don't provide good stewardship themselves. Drinking the water from the Ganges would be as much as taking a regular course of antibiotics because there's so much waste in there. And finally, something called Ayush, the Indian traditional medicine, which they are looking at things they can do, especially for cancer palliative care. A number of plant-based things for people in chemotherapy or others that have proved effective. And much like medical marijuana in the US, they have 6,000 years of tens of thousands of drugs they think are effective but haven't been able to standardize the production or the quantities or the labeling to be able to sell them in the United States. And so that's another area where health diplomacy really can take advantage of technologies and knowledge that we have and bring it to places it needs to be. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hotez, I'm going to come back to you for a minute, and I want to dig in a little bit on this issue of sort of sustained funding. And I'm, I'm wondering if, as, as a researcher, if you can tell us a little bit more about some of the challenges that you might go through if funding were to stop um, or if you ran out of funding for an existing project. You talked a little about it with the Ebola vaccine, but wondering if you can give us some more examples there. Well, sure. Uh, you know what? We, I, the product development partnership that I run called the Sabin Vaccine Institute depends on working scientists. We have a staff of over uh, almost 40 uh, scientists that are making uh, products in the nonprofit sector like a hookworm and schistosomiasis vaccine and a Chagas vaccine, a leishmaniasis vaccine, and we, we have some good ideas for developing a, a Zika vaccine. All of those people, there are by far and away our big, biggest expense, and I don't know if the others have the same issue, is uh, salary support. That's 80% uh, that's, that's of our costs are paying the salaries of the scientists. And uh, it's, it's quite a challenge to put it together. We do it through a, a hodgepodge of support from the Gates Foundation, the Carlos Slim Foundation, the Japanese government, the Dutch government, the, the um, uh, the U.S. government as well, the NIH, uh, provides us some uh, support. But that all has to be uh, kept going. And unfortunately, it's often very project-specific, and oftentimes it's only very short-term funding, sometimes a year, sometimes two years. And so having longer-term broad support uh, would be an absolute game-changer for us in terms of ensuring, one, retention, and second, that we could uh, embark on new projects for diseases that come along. So right now, you know, even if we get some uh, modest funding for a Zika vaccine, that means pulling scientists off of other projects. So we, we have limited bandwidth in terms of the number of new products that we can take on. So I think it's very important that we identify mechanisms for supporting product development partnerships. We're not the only ones. I know some of the, some of the biotechs are doing some important work uh, in this space, but the biotechs at least have that SBIR, STTR mechanism available to them through the US government. But the PDPs are really being challenged right now. We're, there are 16 of us. Um, many of us supported with initial seed funding from the Gates Foundation, and many of us still have a little support, but we're, we're very much uh, trying to identify alternative mechanisms in order to continue uh, to grow and expand. And that, that's been a huge challenge. Thanks. So I didn't really mean to separate the PDP folks from the U.S. government folks, but let's try to bring things sort of together now. And um, Dr. Ketcher, over to you to talk a little bit about this coordination theme that I mentioned um, is sort of a, a key theme in our, in our policy report this year. Can you talk a little bit about CDC's coordination, you know, across agencies and then with, with global partners, but also with, with partners like PDPs and how CDC works with, um, with its partners to, to be successful in your global health work? Thanks again, and that is a real uh, uh, strength of the report, the calling attention to R&D as a whole government and a cross-sector uh, affair. Um, at CDC, um, we uh, have worked uh, in a number of ways with our, our um, 
our other USG partner agencies. And an example, uh, again, is that Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures Enterprise, which was, uh, which was uh, uh, activated to be able to make uh, testing available for the Ebola virus. In recent months, probably, we've, we've had a really strong record of working closely uh, with the Food and Drug Administration. The, the tests to detect Zika virus, kind of like that technology that Peter described uh, that led to the Ebola vaccine, those are, are scientific uh, breakthroughs that, that uh, haven't progressed because Zika wasn't a disease that uh, that uh, affected very many people. And so research, and it wasn't a high priority for, for research funding. Um, as a result, when we're confronted with the current situation, the tests available are very limited, and they're not, uh, they're not uh, as accurate as they could be. Um, but CDC has been working very hard to make the, those tests available. There's no commercial partner yet. Uh, and uh, through end user uh, agreements on the part of the Food and Drug Administration, we've been able to make two tests, one for the antibody and one for the, uh, the uh, virus DNA or RNA itself, uh, available to states and territorial health departments and to countries confronting the epidemic right now. Um, I think working with uh, working outside the government sector is also an important strength. There's work we're doing with uh, multiple partners through our research cooperative agreements to develop new point of care tests for specific pathogens. Maybe another really promising work that we're we're pursuing on multiple fronts uh, are for technologies that would allow us to test for for 20 or 30 different. Uh, potential causes of illness in the same uh, sample of blood, rather than uh, having to, to take a tube full of blood and, and portion it out into 20 or 30 different uh, aliquots and test each one with a separate protocol. There are technologies that, that are being adapted to be able to look across a whole range of pathogens, and this could be the breakthrough that's necessary to help us understand how do you make a decision about antibiotic use, or how do you uh, make a decision in the field about whether uh, an NTD elimination program is reaching a threshold at which uh, it could change strategies and move on. Um, I think that uh, we're really encouraged by the, uh, the growing opportunities to work with uh, partners outside the government as well as across uh, our HHS agencies and across U.S. government. I guess the other area where the Zika experience is, is helping us, you know, we, we're having to seriously uh, expand our... our uh, approaches to how we might control mosquitoes, and that requires that we work, uh, we work with the EPA in a way that, that Ebola and other recent health, uh, health uh, emergencies haven't. Thank you. May, may I just add on to that? Sure. So one comment I'd like to make is it's really, I think, very important for people in this room to realize that the global health technologies we're talking about today are not just for the poorest people in Sub-Saharan Africa and in, in, in Southeast Asia, as important as that is. But we have to remember now with this finding that most of the world's neglected diseases are in G20 countries, that includes the United States. So our estimates are that there are 12 million Americans living in poverty with a neglected tropical disease, uh, led by diseases such as Chagas disease, toxicoriasis, toxoplasmosis, cystocercosis. I like to call them the most important diseases you've never heard of. They're actually incredibly common, but they're mostly striking the poor, mostly people of color, uh, more in the American South uh, than anywhere else. And um, so supporting global health technologies is not, and it's, it's important to, when you, when you talk to your bosses, say it's not only just a matter of helping people abroad. It's, uh, this is enlightened, enlightened uh, 
self-interest as well. Uh, I, I believe that the Gulf Coast region, for instance, and I've written about this recently, uh, is a risk region that's also vul vulnerable uh, to Zika virus infection. We had, Houston had dengue in 2003, mostly in the poor, among the poor neighborhoods of Houston, and the Gulf Coast cities, Houston, New Orleans, Mobile, Tampa, are all at risk for a Zika virus infection, especially as we move into the warmer months. Uh, and are, we've already uh, identifying Aedes aegypti mosquitoes in Houston. Uh, the numbers are still low, but they'll start to climb as we go towards the end of May and into June. That's when we historically have had dengue, and that's when I think we're likely to have Zika as well. Well, that's a, a good segue, I think, to, to tie in the sort of domestic concerns with some of the global concerns. and. Maybe um, back to you, Ambassador Kolker, to build around this theme of coordination. And Dr. Ketcher used some key buzzwords that we've been hearing a lot, this whole of government approach. And so I was wondering if maybe you can talk a little about the coordination aspect um, sort of and bringing in that, that domestic focus as well as you think about how HHS coordinates um, across agencies around these issues. Sure, and thank, thanks for the questions and comments. It's a challenge because uh, Ebola was a great example when the Ebola cases were all in a West Africa. There was a conference call almost every day and people were concerned about that. But as soon as the first case came to the United States, the number of people on those calls were multiplied by about 30. And the sense of what are we ready, what would be the weak links, um, involves so many more people and not just because our government is decentralized and Health in particular has so many actors, but, but also because we, at that point, didn't have a clear platform on which the Ebola response was, was being um, launched. And it, I should say that it's not just domestic and U.S. international participation, but this administration is very much a multilateralist one. If there are things that we can do with partners to, make, to ease the burden on ourselves and make sure that there is equal responsibility among others, especially through organizations like World Health Organization, mm -hmm. that would be the desired solution. And we all know that all of us fumbled the ball to some extent at the beginning of the Ebola outbreak, but in particular, World Health Organization was not able to provide that kind of platform or as people were talking about plug-in mm -hmm. response where foreign medical teams or experts or uh, treatment centers could be based on a platform already in Liberia or, or Sierra Leone and, or Guinea. And so I think the U.S. interagency process became that kind of platform. And we have, I, although the outcome in the end has been a good one and we're, Ebola is now, although it's not eliminated, it's a routine out, disease which an, a health system in the countries that are affected can take advantage of, we also realized that we needed for our own benefit, both financial and health benefit, to be sure that the capacity of other countries was built in a way that it would be much more rare that an outbreak like that would become an epidemic or a national humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. And so the global health security agenda, which we actually devised before we knew Ebola was going to be a problem, turned out to be the answer to that question. There is, again, uniquely, there, there are only two binding international health treaties. One of them is the international health regulations. Mm -hmm. And so all countries do have a standard which they're supposed to meet in terms of disease detection, surveillance, reporting, protocols in place, emergency operation centers. But uh, less than a third of the countries in the world had achieved the compliance. But now we are accelerating that. And thanks again to one portion of the Ebola supplemental that was passed in December 2014, we suddenly have a budget for something which we did not before, which is our ability to work with countries to have them meet these international health regulations in a much more systematic way. And I should say Ebola also opened their eyes, whereas before they were very reluctant to have a international attention to their self-reported strengths or weaknesses in, in preparedness and, and response. Uh, Ebola caused more than 100 countries to want some international help in saying, what would we do if, the, if a case came here? Right. So we're that is very much multi-sectoral and whole of government in that there are law enforcement and security aspects because the pathogen could be a bioterrorist uh, uh, origin, but also that the huge number of outbreaks and looking at what can we do quickly in terms of field epidemiology and um, government capacity, having an incident management system 
and WHO has caught up and has put all those pieces in place. Um, I think the Zika response is a good example of where many of those, both the reporting originally from Brazil and transparency, but also the ability of WHO to look at neighboring countries to try to bring the world's attention to this and then bring in at an early time CDC and other outside partners who could, who could help um, be sure that this was contained in, as much as it can be. Yeah, no, thank you. I think we, there were a lot of lessons learned from Ebola and we can sort of pick and, and choose sort of the pieces of that that we've seen and, and have um, watched unfold. And I don't know that we expected so soon to have another outbreak that we would be able to compare it to and to see if we're doing a better job. But um, hopefully that is the case with, with Zika. But I'll just say the, the analogy, I think neither Ebola in West <coughs> Africa nor Zika in Brazil would have been Professor Plum in the ballroom with the lead pipe. <laughs> you would not have picked those cards to say, this is where the next this is global health emergency is going to be. But we, it means we have to prepare for all of them, and we have to look at the full deck of cards. Yeah. No. That's, thank you. Um, Dr. Schultz, I'm going to come back to you and move away from this coordination piece a bit and talk a bit more about innovation. And I know PATH has some really exciting innovations in global health, and I thought it might be helpful to sort of hear about some of those and give some examples. I know you brought some props um, to sort of show and tell some of the things that PATH is working on. Uh, thanks very much. I do love props, and so I do have a couple to share. And before I do so, I just wanted to say that, you know, segueing from the coordination theme, innovation in health technology and other spaces does not take place in isolation. In innovation takes place within an enabling ecosystem. And in our context, that enabling ecosystem invo you know, involves the NIH, the FDA, HHS, the CDC, our close colleagues and friends at, at other product development partnerships, private sector participants. If you partner with them enough, do, you, do they get to wear bow ties too eventually? Or is that, <laughs> is that not? We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. I was saying uh, to, uh, to Aaron earlier that uh, while a bow tie is, is quite, uh, you know, a common uh, accessory in, in D.C. And, and for me is, is really a, a way of continuing to uh, let Peter know how important he is to me and, and to um, <laughs> highlight for all of you how important Peter Hotez is to us. Uh, but also uh, in Seattle, I never get to wear a bow tie because if you wear a bow tie in Seattle, somebody <laughs> assumes that something is up or maybe you're too fancy for that town. So I take the opportunity to wear the bow tie when I can. Thanks. But uh, innovation does take place in this enabling ecosystem, and uh, that involves uh, countries outside of the U.S. as well, where we're having the chance not only to implement and, and test and validate, but more and more to actually source uh, new uh, innovations as well. And, and while we don't have time to go into to this in depth, I would really highlight that this area, whether we call it reverse innovation, whether we call it boomerang technologies, we have many great examples of technologies that have already come back to the U.S., GE has a, a, a pocket-sized ultrasound device that was originally uh, devised for China called the Viscan. Um, and my favorite example, Gatorade, was actually invented in the 60s, largely based on work that was done in Bangladesh to help rehydrate children uh, from deadly and debilitating cases of diarrhea. True stories both, and just the tip of the iceberg. So, as you mentioned, we have a lot of great examples of innovation within this ecosystem, many of which PATH is very fortunate to be involved in. Um, I would highlight for everybody the IC2030 report because I think that it helps to pull together uh, in a rigorous fashion what some of these most promising innovations are and also what the impact may be. And what I'm going to highlight too, and I do have my props, in the IC2030 report, one of the uh, opportunities that's really highlighted is the opportunity of clean water, or at least cleaner water. Um, every year, dirty water that's contaminated with different uh, microbes, sometimes bacterial, sometimes viral, causes millions of cases of diarrhea. We estimate that through providing clean water at the community level in low- and middle-income countries, it's possible to actually prevent 1.5 million child deaths over the next 15 years. Absolutely astounding. One of the uh, technologies that we've worked on with a local company uh, in Seattle is called the uh, MSR SE200 uh, Community Chlorine Maker. You can tell that we're scientists and not marketers because we call it the <laughs> SE200 Community Chlorine Maker. We're working on this. 
Um, this is a remarkable device that uh, in just five minutes with just a solution of salt and water, need not even be clean water, actually makes enough chlorine to, uh, in just a spoonful, to actually safely disinfect a 55-gallon drum full of water. Uh, this is a remarkable opportunity for those who've traveled in low- and middle-income countries. You know that uh, you can get bottled water, you can get Coca-Cola, thank goodness, one of my favorite beverages. <laughs> but if you are not able to afford bottled water, or if you happen to be too far from the local kiosk or store, you're not going to get this, and this is not going to keep your family going. For a family of four or five, you need 20 to 30 liters of clean water every day. So this device not only is making cleaner and clean water possible in low-income settings, it actually inspired this local company, MSR Cascade Designs, who many of you know uh, because they manufacture outdoor goods like Thermarest, uh, mattresses, and stoves. Um, to actually launch on their own accord their MSR Global Health Division. This is a wonderful story. It will be in the back if you want to see it more. The other uh, prop that I have is even bulkier. <laughs> And uh, I don't mean to cover up Peter for those on this <laughs> side of the room. I just want to show you this, and then I'll take it off the table. This will also be in back. One of the problems with actually safely transporting vaccines for important programs like the Global Polio Eradication Program that the U.S. government has been such a steadfast supporter of is actually not just keeping vaccines cold enough, but in fact preventing them from freezing. And so one of the things that PATH has done is work with a number of partners, including the World Health Organization, to make sure that we can transport vaccines safely without freezing those vaccines. And one of the best consequences of this is not only are children and others getting highly active, safe polio immunization that allows us to eradicate polio, but it's actually making aid dollars, including USA dollars, go further by virtue of not wasting uh, that vaccine. They would otherwise perhaps get too hot or too cold. So again, both of these will be in the back. I'm happy to talk more about them, but I wanted to give you some sense of what these tangible uh, types of, uh, of innovations are, not just the vaccines and the drugs that we've already been talking about, but in many cases, what we would call devices or tools. Thanks. Thanks for bringing the props. I, I do appreciate that. Um, so, Dr. Ketcher, I'm going to ask you to expand a little bit. Um, Ambassador Kolker mentioned the global health security agenda. We've talked about Zika. We've talked about Ebola. But CDC's global health security work goes well beyond those two diseases. And there's the global health security agenda. There are other global health security activities. It's getting a lot of buzz on the Hill right now. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about um, how R&D fits into that sort of broader global health security agenda at CDC. Well, thanks. I think uh, Ambassador Kolker's comments on the context of uh, GHSA really, uh, really set this up nicely. Um, a lot of our focus right now in, uh, in the global health security agenda is uh, working with some, some uh, countries that the U.S. government has prioritized for assistance as phase one countries and working uh, multilaterally across uh, the U.S. government and across uh, WHO and multiple partners to uh, help ensure that, uh, that countries are able to complete uh, an assessment looking at their current state of readiness as defined by their compliance with the international health regulations. Uh, we're, we're supporting countries to do this. We're working with the international community to make the resources and, and expertise available uh, for as many countries as possible to undertake this. And we're undertaking it on our own behalf. As a member state, the United States is uh, participating in its own assessment of its readiness. And we'll have uh, external uh, uh, team of evaluators here in Washington and in Atlanta next month toward that end. But the global health security uh, agenda as it becomes realized uh, involves commitments not just from, from the US, but from the member countries as well. A lot of our focus is on building systems. And oftentimes, that's not something that we think of as an R&D opportunity. 
Um, but we're finding that there are uh, technologies and innovations that uh, can really revolutionize some of our bread and butter uh, core public health uh, practices. I mean, a real essential uh, tool of public health is surveillance. You need to count the number of cases of illness, you need to have an accurate idea of what caused those illnesses, and you need to track those trends in space and time so that you have an idea when something out of the ordinary appears. You know what the baseline looks like, and you can recognize a signal. Well, our, our uh, systems for surveillance are still based on an old, old, old-fashioned idea of pen and paper uh, being, you know, an individual nurse or clinician recording each case one by one on paper and compiling those and sending them up to their supervisor and up to the district and up to the region and up to the, the national level. And as you might guess, in poorly resourced places, the, all those steps are, are just opportunities for the things to fall apart. There's no reason we need a pen and paper system anymore. We move information all the time. <laughs> the health workers that are filling out these forms also carry uh, in their pocket a device on which they track their favorite football team's performance last night. So um, we, we need to be able to look at how technology uh, can, can improve these fundamental systems uh, uh, investments we're making, not only in surveillance, in laboratory capacity, in workforce capacity, and in building the emergency response systems that we're working on. Thank you. Thanks. We're gonna turn it over to uh, audience Q&A. I just want a show of hands to see about how many questions we have, and I wanna make sure we can get to as many of you as possible. We have microphones um, moving around the room, so if you can hold your hands up high, Marissa will come find you. <laughs> or Matt will come find you. One in the front here, and if you can just give your name and your organization so that our panelists know who they're speaking to, that would be great. Hi, I'm Jessica Taft from Global Renaissance Enterprises. Um, I, I really appreciate the, the discussion you had on the global health security agenda, but you guys didn't talk about another really important agenda in the global health sphere, and that's the sustainable development goals. So I wondered if you could discuss how global health R&D factors into that and what policy solutions you have in mind that would ensure that global health R&D is um, represented and, and is part of the implementation of them. Great. May I take this one? Sure. Well, the, uh, the sustainable development goals, which as everyone likely knows, are the follow-on to the uh, Millennium Development Goals. Are, are critically important as an organizing mechanism for us in global health R&D. And in particular, we're very focused on the SDG number three, and I'm very focused on this one, uh, in, because it includes ending preventable maternal and child deaths, which are two of the most important metrics that we're focused on in PATH. The US SDGs are also, the UN and the SDGs are also very important to me, because 2030 is the year that I plan to retire, <laughs> and I have publicly committed, and within my family committed, that I do not intend to retire until actually we have ended preventable maternal and child deaths around the world. And so I know that R&D is an important component of that, but it, as, as much promise as R&D and health technologies have, as your question alludes to, they are not enough to solve the problem. They are critically important, they are enabling, but without the type of coordination globally, without the right policies in place, and without integrated solutions that actually fit well into health systems, into communities, and into the cultures and the societies in which we want them to actually exert their beneficial effect, even the most promising innovative technologies will fall flat. And so I would encourage us to take that global view to obviously see how and, and to continue to foster the development and support the development of new uh, health technologies, but not to imagine that health technologies alone without the enabling policy or the integrated delivery and access platforms will actually be able to really uh, fulfill their promise. Yes, Just, uh, Dr. Hotez and then down to Ambassador Colker. Oh, sorry. Okay. We can go. Okay. Ambassador Colker first then. No, 
Peter's deferring to you. <laughs> right, because in some ways I'm answering procedurally as well. A number of people from Global Health Technology Coalition with the U.S. government tried to get very specific language into the um, sustainable development goals on health technology. Mm -hmm. And the answer was, well, it's implied. It's necessary for everything. And I think we collectively have to be responsible for really making that happen. Goal three is the health goal. It's quite comprehensive. There's, there's a lot in there. But we think that at least nine and maybe even more of the other goals also depend on health and will have health consequences if, uh, as they're achieved. So it, it is incumbent on all of us to look especially for innovation because I think some of the, ind the indicators, and there are now 180-something indicators that are being developed, but they're based on already collected information. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that puts us in a mindset where we're not innovating, we're just looking at what's been done for decades. And I, I think that all of us have a responsibility to be sure that it's forward-looking, that we really are measuring things that matter in terms of outcomes, and that we're looking at the role technology can play. Because it's true, it's, it's not inherent. There's no government that's going to have to pay more attention to health technology just because of what's written in the SDGs. No, thank you for raising that. At GHTC worked hard with our colleagues, both inside and outside the government, to ensure that there was a way to measure R&D within SDG number three, I'll, so appreciate I'll, that. I'll just add that, you know, the other, you know, the, the SDGs are very far reaching because yes, only health is one of the 17 goals, but the others relate to climate change, the environment, uh, water, kind of the rule of conflict. And to give you an example of why integrating that is so important when we talk about disease, we can look at a couple of examples. I'll just give one. In Southern Europe right now, we've seen something really strange happening. Uh, after 70 years, malaria has reappeared in Greece. Uh, chikungunya, West Nile virus, has uh, reoccurred in uh, s Southern Spain. Uh, in Italy, dengue in Portugal. We now have schistosomiasis in the island of Corsica when it, it's never come out of Africa before. Uh, so I wrote a piece for my favorite journal, Vice, uh, which <laughs> compared this to the early sequences of the Ghostbusters movie where you saw the green blob on the table in the hotel and, and you saw the skeleton in the taxi cab and you knew something really bad was about to happen but you couldn't quite piece it all together and connect all the dots. Well, so what, what, what's the origin of that? And is it, uh, and you talk to different people, it's like, you know, four blind people looking at trying to understand the elephant. One person will say, well, it's obviously climate change. If you talk to the climate change people next to the Arctic, uh, it, uh, Southern Europe is the next big shoe to fall. And another person will say, well, wait a minute. And you talk to the Jeffrey Sachs of the world, he'll say, everyone knows Southern Europe just went through this massive economic downturn. It's clearly the poverty. Uh, or someone else will say, hey, guys, do you know there's a conflict going on just a few miles away in a place that's called Syria and Iraq and Libya, and we're seeing massive human migrations coming over uh, from those regions. Or is it a combination of the three? And one of the things that we haven't figured out is we have, are not, we're not training scientists to think uh, in those terms, to think broadly, to be able to uh, uh, intersect at different levels and multidisciplinary levels. So one of the challenges that we're going to face as we develop these technologies is we're going to have to have our biomedical scientists not only talk to the engineers and the physical scientists, but also talk to the sociologists, the political economists, and the list goes on. Thank you. I think we had a question right up here in the front, Marissa. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> uh, Jared Gallagher from Center for Disease News. Um, Dr. Kedrick talked about there not being enough resources for Zika. Um, because Zika wasn't a priority. And um, Ambassador Kolker talked about the money that we spent on Ebola. Um, I was wondering, to the extent that we seem not to be ready for certain things when they come up, even though we know things like Ebola and Zika are out there, is having enough money the most important thing in fighting these things? Do we have enough money? The, one of the recommendations in the first part of this is that Congress appropriate certain amounts of money to certain agencies. Is that a lot more now that's being appropriated now? And do we have enough? And it's for anybody who wants to answer. So is it all about the money? Or is there? Right, as our congressional staff colleagues here know very well, the, Executive branch isn't able to lobby Congress for any particular request, but the administration has put forward Zika requests based on what we think are very realistic scenarios of what we need, especially to protect the homeland, but also um, 
that could enable us to work with partners to look at the spread and look at what we're already learning, for instance, from the case cohort studies that CDC did with Brazil. And of course, we're not stopping that work because there's no money. Money isn't the only thing that's going to matter. We need lots of uh, creative responses on, on other things. But um, it, when you, I guess I'll put it in the most macro possible context that probably over the next 50 years, the cost in lives and money to the global system of the threat of terrorism, of climate change, and of epidemics is, you could just say, in the same ballpark, about the same. And the amount we're investing rightly in looking at uh, preventing terrorism and looking at, or dealing with consequences of terrorism, same with climate change, so far outstrip what we're doing in terms of outbreaks and epidemics that uh, I guess from the health side, we want to be sure that people are putting this in that perspective and paying attention to the potential consequences of failing to deal with what are inevitably uh, outbreaks of, of global importance, even if we can't predict exactly when they'll occur or where or what our response needs to be. Thank you. Other questions? Yep. Um, Karen, and I see a couple of our hands up here. I don't know where the... Thanks, Marissa. For bringing a very personal perspective to research and development. We don't often hear this side, and yet this really, I know really well, this is what drives all of you. I have two comments on the money side. One is that the way Congress appropriates money in terms of a cycle does not work with science funding. We have this <laughs> constant, no fit, example of how the money tries to work and it doesn't work. Secondly, what I hear from our young investigators is I'm not sure I can stay in the job I want because I don't see a future for me. And these are potential NIH funded investigators. Just 20 years ago, this was a very different field where people could take their passion and know that they would be able to have a career, pay the mortgage, send the kids to school, and now they're making very pragmatic dis decisions. So the epidemics concerned me of what's going to come, but what also really worries me is that we're not going to have the people to be innovative to bring these technologies to bear. Thanks, Karen. Any comment, Peter? Well, I'll just say Karen is right. I should also mention that um, if I didn't make it out of Houston, Karen was going to be sitting <laughs> sitting here. Thank you for offering to do that. Um, what you're saying is absolutely right. We've had two decades now of flatline NIH funding, which means that effectively we're, they're putting out 20% less now than they were two decades ago, and it's, it's having an absolutely chilling effect on our young scientists, and we're not going to realize the impact for at least another decade, and then we're going to realize we don't have young people as scientists anymore. Um, so we're clearly, uh, you know, I used to say we're going to lose supremacy to Singapore and China uh, and Europe, and now I'm saying we've already started losing supremacy to Singapore. Uh, China and Europe, um, to the point now where my young scientists are going to Germany, they're actually going to China uh, to uh, where they're being recruited, where they have better funding opportunities, uh, Singapore and elsewhere. So uh, even if we were to fix it tomorrow, it's, we're still going to take us a couple of decades to catch up, but we have to do something about it very soon. Thank you for, Thanks, for raising Peter. that. We can have time for probably one more question, and then I want to give each of the panelists just one minute in terms of final um, final thoughts. There. Okay. Uh, Sorry. It's okay. Uh, my name is Nam. Uh, I'm a cancer doctor. I'm a president of an international research organization composed of American and uh, European uh, cancer. Uh, we have invented a new technique of radiation called image guided radiation therapy that that get the cancer like a smart bomb and minimize collateral damage. And uh, emerging country heard about us and asked us to develop cancer center in the country like Vietnam, Costa Rica, and other countries as well. Um, 
for a cancer center to build a cancer center, it's a minimum of $10 million or above. Mm -hmm. right? We have no problem to get investors. We already started. The question I have is this, the law in each country is very different. So if I have investor to develop cancer center, what guarantee do we have that will be protected? Uh, because uh, we gave the expertise, we invest the money, and uh, what happened if they say, oh, we done the support, sayonara? So that's my question. Uh, how do we deal with international law? Because uh, the law, say, in Vietnam, is very different from Costa Rica or India, for example. Yeah. We hadn't really talked about non-communicable diseases, but if anybody wants to. Well, I, I will just say very briefly that, um, you know, we know, as Peter was saying, with respect to our supremacy on the world stage in the, in the scientific arena, we know, although we used to talk about this coming wave of non-communicable diseases in low and middle income countries, the wave has come just like the waters have come to Houston and almost prevented Peter from being here. <laughs> uh, we have individuals, communities, countries, where diseases like multidrug resistant tuberculosis sit side by side, sometimes unfortunately in the same individual, with diabetes, cancer, heart disease, obesity, and many of the other non-communicable diseases. I frankly don't know what the answer is going to be mm -hmm. in terms of what the global response from a funding standpoint needs to be, but it is likely on the order of the climate change challenge in terms of really taking on non-communicable diseases in the context of already this tremendous and in some cases increasing burden of communicable diseases as, as Peter pointed out. However, I think that in, in, the, in the shell of this very bad news story is, uh, you know, is in fact uh, a nut of opportunity. And I think that being able to answer some of the questions that you pose, which I don't have good <laughs> answers for today, allows us the opportunity to truly see these conditions, not as, well, these things happen in high-income countries and these things happen in low-income countries. This is truly global health. It's just like Peter was saying. When we have neglected tropical diseases occurring in 12 million Americans and we have very serious but treatable cancers and other non-communicable diseases occurring in our friends and colleagues who may live in Vietnam, may live in Kinshasa, may live in, in the poor provinces of China. This gives us the opportunity to say, this is not about rich countries helping poor countries. This is not about uh, diseases recognizing geographical borders. This is truly about global health. And in many ways, I think, in, within this challenge is an enormous opportunity to finally tackle global health as a global concern rather than one that is highly segmented and where we have artificial distinctions between what we believe happens here and what we believe happens there. Thank you. Yeah. So what we've okay. seen is the, the blurring of neglected diseases, non-communicable diseases. So in India, the, the people who die of dengue are those with underlying diabetes and hypertension. That's the new syndrome that's happening in India. We're seeing new tuberculosis, diabetes syndromes in Mexico and even on the border in Texas. Uh, and the same with cancer. Uh, the estimates are now that 21% of cancers actually have infectious etiologies, and that number is 21 only because not more have been discovered. Uh, so that, that number increases every year. So you've got, for instance, liver fluke, a worm is the leading cause of bile duct cancer, uh, causing an epidemic in, in Thailand and Laos and in, uh, in Cambodia, or you have schistosomiasis is the leading cause of bladder cancer mm -hmm. in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, we're very much seeing a, a, a melding of all of these things. Thanks. So for the lightning round, I'm yeah. going to start with you, Ambassador Kolker. Uh, we've had a great conversation today about lots of things that we might do, but the sort of one to two key takeaways from each of you about where we go from here as a global community to ensure that we can reach these goals and invest in R&D. Sure, I'll, I'll pick up right where that last mm -hmm. question was because I think there's actually a new development paradigm now that this idea of donor countries and recipient countries is kind of 20th century. And mm -hmm. what countries, even the poorest, want from the United States is, how do you solve these problems in the US? What do your best experts say? And what do they know? And how can you build capacity in our country to be able to deal with our own populations. And as we've made remarkable progress in, in infectious diseases and maternal and child survival, 
it's also a question where we have huge expertise and tremendous capacity in non-communicable diseases, in integrating health into other sectors. And I think that our ability to be the cutting edge, to be sure we're investing in R&D, that we're looking at how the public sector can be the enabler of the private sector to keep our competitive edge as the U.S., is really important, not just to us, but to all the other countries who know that we're the leader and want to use our technology or our uh, expertise in order to solve real day-to-day -day health and, and societal problems in their countries. So the work that you all do is, is terrific, and it's, it's something of which we as Americans can be proud, but it's not a given. Yeah. We need to keep paying attention to it for it to work. Thank you very much. Dr. Katcher. Thanks. I'd, I'd maybe like to make a couple of points. The first uh, is to echo what Peter reminded us of and several other speakers, uh, is the importance of uh, global health uh, to Americans and as a, as a concern of Americans. At CDC, our interest and in our, our uh, work in global health begins and ends with our responsibility to protect Americans at home uh, and when they're working and traveling and living abroad. Um, I think the other key thing I'd like to emphasize is to remind you to keep a perspective on the entire R&D cycle. Again, really important stuff has to happen at the very basic level to contribute to the advances we need. Um, but think beyond the bench, think beyond the, the uh, hospital-based clinical trial and think about uh, the R&D cycle extending to adapting technology to field situations and uh, being able to, to then translate those, uh, those R&D gains into the policies and programs that are necessary for them to deliver on their promise of saving lives. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Schultz, those key moments for you and where we go from here. Well, first of all, I want to come... I want to come back to the theme that we started off on, which is really about gratitude. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your support. Thank you to our moderator and to GHTC for giving us this platform. And I wanted to really borrow from something that Peter said, which is, in the end, this is not just about the opportunity to uh, change lives around the world. This is about, as actually the ambassador said, to, to really have our own lives changed as well. This is very much enlightened self-interest. And as we think about global health, let us not think that we are doing for others. Rather, let us take the perspective that we are doing uh, for ourselves, for others, and that U.S. leadership has mattered, it continues to matter, and it will matter. And none of us should underestimate how important that component of soft di diplomacy is in the wider world. Thank you. Dr. Hotez. Thank you. Well, first of all, this has been a very rich discussion today. Thank you so much for that. I think what we're, what we're now seeing is uh, the world is morphing slowly, but it's morphing. This concept of developing versus developed countries, I think in a few years we're going to see that as your father's global health or as your mother's global health. What we're now seeing is a uh, general rise in all economies, including 8% economic growth in Africa, but it's leaving behind a bottom segment of society. And so what's emerging now is the two dominant themes of these diseases we're discussing is poverty and poverty and conflict. Wherever you can show large populations that live in poverty or live in conflict, these are where you're finding uh, these diseases. So the reason why Zika is emerging in northeastern Brazil is that is the largest concentration of poor people in, in, the, in, in, in the Western Hemisphere uh, right now. Um, the other place that we're seeing a massive resurgence of diseases in the conflict zones of Syria and Iraq and, and Libya and Yemen. We've seen now the reemergence of polio and measles, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of cases of leishmaniasis and dengue and schistosomiasis, all arriving from this, con this combination of either poverty or poverty and conflict uh, together. And the problem is we don't have a mechanism for supporting the new innovations that are needed for these uh, new 21st century uh, diseases. Uh, so what's happened is our technical ability to make these innovations 
uh, have outpaced our social, political, and financial instruments that we have to, to get them to develop. And that's why what the Global Health Technology Coalitions is so, why it's so important. It's to kind of bring that together uh, and, and to harmonize uh, those two spheres. And, uh, and we need to do something very fast because right now, the commitment among young people to public service is at an all-time high. I mean, I teach at a university, two universities, and uh, one, it's, it's one of the most exciting things. I love being a professor because young people want to serve, and one of the ways they want to serve is to become scientists and make these technologies for the poor and for those who live in conflict and for refugees. And we're increasingly devoid of having mechanisms to support them, and we have to figure out a way to fix that. And I know if anyone could do it, it's the US Congress. <laughs> Well, it's been an honor to sit here with the four of you and have this conversation today. It's been a really rich discussion. So special thank you to all of you for, for joining us and for giving us your time. As you can see, we have plenty more questions from the audience and we weren't able to get to everything we wanted to talk about today, which is always a good sign for, for conversation. I want to encourage everybody to, to walk around the perimeter of the room and see the exhibits if you haven't had a chance to do so yet. Um, and please join me in thanking our panel.